Thank you, Savannah and Tom, for those kind words. And Senator Elizabeth, I think Senator Bob probably heard you when you said, let there be sun, right? So there you go. Perfect timing. He heard your prayer. I want to welcome everyone here, and I want to particularly welcome anyone who served in the Second World War. Are there any World War II veterans here today? I am incredibly humbled uh, to have the honor to speak here today as the son of a mother who served in World War II and took care of the wounded from the Pacific and a father who served with the 4th Marine Division and hit the beach at Kwajalein and Saipan and Tinian and Iwo Jima. And like Senator Bob, they passed on. But it truly is a remarkable generation. And today is a solemn day for our nation as we collectively mourn, but more importantly, we celebrate the life of Senator Bob Dole. An incredible example of a lifetime of selfless service to our nation. And it's fitting that we're here, surrounded by this World War II monument that Senator Dole did so much to build. A memorial dedicated to 16 million Americans who donned the cloth of our nation and fought in World War II. Almost a half a million paid the ultimate sacrifice in the defense of the liberties that we enjoy every day. Senator Dahl's commitment to this democracy was unwavering, a democracy that he died to defend, and he died just recently in order to give his life for this country. He almost died in World War II. He had a life of service defending this democracy, and we honor him today for his entire life. Senator Dole began his career serving the United States on the battlefields of Europe during World War II, as so many here know. Eighty years ago this week, on 7 December 1941, the Japanese launched a surprise attack on what we now know is a day of infamy, an attack on our fleet at Pearl Harbor. Senator Dole was just a humble kid from Russell, Kansas, whose family had struggled through the Depression, through the Dust Bowl. And on that day, on 7 December 1941, he was just a freshman in college at the University of Kansas. And like many young Americans, like you, like my mother, like my father, like many of our mothers and fathers. A surprise attack on the United States on that day invoked his patriotic spirit and began his journey to the hell of combat. Second Lieutenant Dole was assigned to the famous 10th Mountain Division. And we are blessed today to have the commanding general of the current 10th Mountain Division here with us, along with his sergeant major. At the time, in World War II, the 10th Mountain was in Northern Italy, fighting in the Apennine Mountains against a fortified German defense known as the Gothic Line. Bob Dole, Lieutenant Dole, was assigned to the 85th Infantry, and he was the platoon leader for 2nd Platoon, India Company, positioned near a small town of Ayano in Northern Italy. India Company's mission was to attack and seize Hill 913, a small hill located just to the northwest of the town. And that hill covered, it was the dominating feature and covered the terrain at the mouth of the valley that the U.S. forces needed to cross. The company, including 2nd Lieutenant Dole and his 2nd Platoon, commenced the attack in the early morning hours of 14 February 1945, less than 30 days before VE Day, celebrating the end of the war in Europe in May. After only going a short distance, one of the men in front of the column in Lieutenant Dole's platoon stepped on a landmine, triggering an explosion that shattered the stillness of the morning. 
The world exploded around Lieutenant Cole and his company as machine guns began to fire and grenades and mortars filled the air as German soldiers concealed in their defensive position opened fire on the 10th Mountain. The company commander called Lieutenant Dole and told him to continue the attack. He gave his platoon the mission to take out the German machine gun nest. Lieutenant Dole assembled the assault squad and positioned the rest of his men forward to provide covering fire. He was 21 years old. He and his soldiers attacked without hesitation, led by the lieutenant, Lieutenant Bob Dole. Initially crawling on their bellies through an open field and then rushing forward up a hill with the enemy machine gun. As they closed in on the German position, the German fire intensified and many of the soldiers in the 2nd Platoon were wounded or killed. Lieutenant Dole looked around him he looked for his radio man, his RTO, Private Sims. And he saw him a short distance away, slumped over, not moving, still clutching his radio. Lieutenant Dole scrambled across the dirt where Private Sims lay. Lieutenant Dole grabbed him by the shirt and began to drag him toward the relative safety of a nearby bomb crater. They hadn't moved more than a few feet when an enemy machine gun and shrapnel from an exploding mortar round tore into Bob Dole's back near his right shoulder, the impact throwing him to the ground. He was very badly wounded. His right arm and shoulder were completely mangled. His spinal cord was severely damaged and he was unable to move either his arms or his legs. Another soldier, Frank Carrara, reached out and dragged Lieutenant Dole, dragged him back behind a nearby stone wall, and thereby saved his life. Lieutenant Dole lay there, facing up in the dirt, not knowing whether he would live or die, unable to move as the battle raged around him. And he lay there for 10 consecutive hours before medics were able to reach him. India Company fought all through the day and into the next day, and they finally took Bill 913. In the end, India Company, Bob Dole's company, and the other 10th Mountain units fighting for Hill 913 suffered 460 casualties, of which 98 were killed in action. Medics eventually got to Lieutenant Dole and they evacuated him. He left the battlefields of Italy and his war was over. But his fight was really just beginning. For months, he was largely confined to a bed, as Tom Hanks mentioned, in a full body cast. He fought blood clots and life-threatening infections. And he fought despair and hope. But just as he did in the dirt on Hill 913, Lieutenant Dole refused to give in. And as we know, he persevered, he healed, and he went on to distinguish himself in the service of his country, this country, many, many times over, in both the House of Representatives and the Senate, over a 35-year political career. After leaving Congress in 1996, Senator Dole didn't slow down. He didn't stop advocating for worthy causes. In addition to practicing law and authoring several books, he served as a board member for the World Food Program. He served as the head of the Memorial Foundation for this memorial, and he raised millions of dollars to make this a reality. So today we're honoring a man of deep character and tremendous accomplishment, a long and impressive record of selfless service. He suffered, he endured, and he showed us all what hope can do. So why? Why did Bob Dole do it? Why did Bob Dole raise his right hand in 1942 and swear an oath of allegiance to the Constitution of the United States of America? And after being wounded, when he couldn't raise his right hand any longer, he raised his left hand to swear his oath. 
Why? Why knowing the danger he could be wounded or killed? Why knowing he will be criticized in the public arena as a politician? Why? Why did he raise his hand on 14 April 1945 and say I'll lead the attack on Hill 913? Why did Bob Dole have such a clear calling to serve? Why did he refuse to be stopped by the enemy? He did it for an idea, an idea that is American. He swore an oath to a document, the Constitution, not to a king or queen or dictator or tyrant. He swore an oath to an idea, an idea that says that no matter who you are, whether you're male or you're female, whether you're black or white or Asian or Indian, or no matter what the color of your skin, it doesn't matter where you came from or what your last name is, it doesn't matter whether you're Catholic or Protestant, Muslim or Jew, it doesn't matter if you believe or you don't believe, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor or from the city or from the country, under the colors that he served, under the colors of red, white and blue, in this country, Bob Knoll knew that we were all born free and equal. And in this country, you're going to have an opportunity. You're going to rise or fall based on your merit, your talent, your skills, your attributes. And you're going to be judged by the content of your character, your integrity, your perseverance, and your willingness to serve. He fought, and more importantly, he lived for an idea, an idea that says a kid from Kansas, some small town who can make it through the Depression, can go to college, play sports, become an officer in the Army, go to law school, run for Congress, become a senator, and run three times for president. He fought and lived. He fought and lived for that idea. And he built this monument to the other 16 million who fought and lived for that idea. When others would have given up, Bob Dole never did. When others saw obstacles, he saw opportunity. He continually raised his hand, mangled as it was, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic. He served the Army. He served the state of Kansas. He served his political party. But above all, he served his country. And he served his fellow Americans. Bob Dole always, always put his country first. He was a great example of a selfless servant of this republic for which we stand.